May I have your attention, please? Welcome. We are so proud to have these two with us uh, this morning. Uh, if you've ever been to the Sacramento um, uh, Rose Garden at the Capitol, these two are responsible for all that beautiful, beautiful work. That's T.J. David and Sylvia Villalobos. They're, he is known as the Rose Man and uh, co-creator of the World Peace Gardens. And Sylvia, uh, has, they have both teamed to found a nonprofit organization to enhance world peace through the creation of a beautiful rose gardens that has become magnets for positive community activities. TJ's idea is that if we see beautiful colors in the garden, that is the diversity of our society, and they're going to make every day a rose show in public gardens. And I give this program over to TJ and Sylvia. Wow. Thank you so much. Why, good morning, everyone. Are you awake and ready? Yeah. Yes, okay, well, we are too, and we are thrilled to be here to share with you what we've been doing uh, over the last 25 years. I think we get so busy doing it that we, doing this PowerPoint sort of made us come back and to see, oh, let's, let's go over what we really have done. So we're hoping today that we can share with you our public gardens around the world, and uh, we'll just, get started. So our presentation today is on behalf of our International World Peace Rose Gardens. And we're going to start off by telling you who we are, what we do, and why we do what we do. I think many of you have never heard of us, and so we can't assume that you know anything about us. So basically, who we are, we are, as Elsina said, we are a nonprofit organization, and we became incorporated in 1988. And we've already been introduced as the co-creators of the organization. So we're very proud to be here on behalf of our organization. What we do, we plant rose gardens for world peace around the world. Right, TJ? You bet. <laughs> <laughs> And what's so magnificent about them is that we put them on sacred, cultural, or historic grounds that have lots of visitors, and they're used by, uh, by many, many millions of people, actually. So why do we do what we do? Well, I thought I'd start by just telling you a little story. It was January 1st, 1984, and I had been trying all evening the night before to go to a special service for the new year at, at my church. And I just, everything stopped me from getting there. So the next morning, it must have been a Sunday, there was a service. And I said, I'm going no matter what. So I got in my car. I went over there. I parked, and boom, my water pump fell out. <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, I'll just wait till after the service. So I came out. And I looked around, and I said, does anybody know how to fix cars? And everybody said, that guy. <laughs> and it was T.J. David. And so I landed up spending six hours with him that day while my car was being fixed. And I had the opportunity to really learn about who he is and what he loves. And I learned that he loved roses and that he really wanted to do something in the world with them. But he didn't know exactly at that time what to do with them. And so I think it sort of uh, uh, it fired the embers within me of things that were important to me, which are education and children and um, peace in the world. And so we started working together just naturally, I guess. And we started taking roses to the hospital. And we could see that. Uh, people really responded, the healing response to roses, as, as you all know, is tremendous. And so we thought, well, gosh, this feels good. Maybe we should do, do this on a bigger scale. So that's when we incorporated in 1988 into a nonprofit. But all these years it had sort of been building, we'd been sharing roses with so many people. 
So we embarked on uh, big projects and decided why not go around the world and do them abroad too. So that's sort of uh, why we do what we do. We just love people and peace. I want to mention that you know our rose is our official flower in the United States of America. So we've always seen our official flower as a silent ambassador of peace and goodwill on the various grounds we have gone in the world. It's in some ways we've been like an unofficial ambassador of the of America with the rose. And so a lot of the places that we've been in the world, they've seen us as such. And it's interesting that that was kind of like their perception. And, and so it's like uh, we've always seen this rose. It's not just um, uh, like a flower, like a marigold or a rhododendron or, or something. This is our official flower. Something, if we're proud to be Americans, then we should be proud to grow our roses and we should be proud to have them showcased in our front yards because if we love America and we love being who we are in our country, this to me is a symbol of what a rose is. And I think that uh, I'm very passionate about the rose and I love America and I, I love what it represents. Yes, he is passionate about roses, let me tell you. <laughs> so I did want to add, too, that in 1986, uh, President Reagan did sign the resolution making the rose uh, the national emblem or flower. So that really was very timely for us, too. So we're, we're going to speak about, uh, first of all, we're going to take on a tour of our World Peace Rose Garden so that you know where they are. And then we're going to talk about the elements of, uh, of a really great public garden and what we have found over the years um, are very popular elements for public gardens. Then we're going to leave a little bit of time at the end for any questions and, uh, and we'll be happy to answer them. So why don't we start by taking you on a tour of our gardens. Do they need airplane tickets to take a tour today? <laughs> yeah, right. You want to do it? Okay. So um, our first one is in, in the Los Angeles area, the Lake Shrine Gandhi Memorial. And I think many people don't know that this is the only place on earth where a portion of Gandhi's ashes are actually kept. There's a beautiful sarcophagus, a thousand year old sarcophagus that holds his uh, ashes behind that structure there. And there's actually a lake between our rose garden and that area. So it's, uh, it's a beautiful place and we're... About 200, yards, about 200 yards between the roses and the memorial there. It's about 200 yards between the memorial and the roses. So it's, it's like an optical illusion there. Yes. So then we decided to go to Mexico City to the Basilica of Our Lady Guadalupe and we were the first Americans ever allowed to do a project on those sacred grounds. And we're, we still don't know to this day why they let us, but uh, I guess it was, uh, we had a little help from up above. So we um, planted that rose garden there in 1988, and TJ took the liberty of planting two of them there. <laughs> so this is uh, when you start going up the stairs. Uh, this area is called Tapiac, and it's where Our Lady of Guadalupe first appeared to Juan Diego, a peasant from Mexico. And I don't know if you all know the story, but it was a miraculous uh, apparition. And the whole story about roses uh, came from this apparition. So roses are very valued there because of Our Lady Guadalupe. So th the bishop from Sacramento said he would introduce us over there, but we had to make a garden for him first. <laughs> so, so that's why we have one, uh, that sister garden for the Mexico City World Peace Rose Garden. Then we went to Assisi, Italy, and uh, we actually went to the Vatican first, and there was nothing but concrete there. And we go, well, where are we gonna put a rose garden? It was uh, high security and there wasn't any place. So we entrained and went to our, our uh, second choice of Italy and St. Francis who worked tirelessly for peace. What I was going to share about that is that uh, in uh, Rome there, uh, we spent four days, you know, just getting our appointments and to meet the, meet the President of the Vatican, finally get the President of the Vatican, and uh, it's really an amazing uh, thing to build, a, you know, to get, work our way up there after all these different meetings and things like this. And, and then after that, we're saying, wow, you know, 
all that work for that you know, half hour meeting, you know, and I'm wondering, wow, just, I don't know. You know, do you think this is going to happen? Could this happen here or not? And then, so he says, we took a train the next morning. The Basilica St. Francis it was always our, our second uh, uh, possibility. And we walked in there, and they had a, uh, on the wall of their entry hall, had a picture of a Buddhist monk hogging the Pope. And I thought, wow, that's very interesting, because you don't normally see that type of, you know, uh, that kind of unit interaction between the two various religions. And then, and then we, 15 minutes later, if we arrived, we told him what we wanted to do. We, f we met Father Max Mizzi, and he travels the world on behalf of peace, and they have their own groups that go out for peace and things like that. The thing I want to talk about Max Mizzi was, the first, one of the first words he says, we've always wanted a rose garden, and now you've come, and you're always welcome here. So you, they just opened their arms to us, and we said, wow, amazing. That was the first 15 minutes. Yep. So then we went to the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site, and they had no flower gardens there at the time. And we went in 1992, and then we redid, well, they completely redid the whole grounds for the 1996 Olympics. So uh, we relocated our rose garden, and they gave us a beautiful site in front of the visitor center, and it's also called the Peace Plaza. So that has been a, a tremendous uh, garden for us. We've, we've enjoyed it so much. Then we went to the state capitol, and this one took us eight years <laughs> to, to actually make a reality. Um, boy, there's lots of hoops working with the state capitol, but we did it, and we have a beautiful garden that uh, is enjoyed by thousands and thousands each year. So, and we, we weren't, we didn't even know this one, but uh, the Sister City Program delegation came and they wanted to choose something to replicate in their country, in their city, Janan, that reminded them of, of Sacramento, and they picked our World Peace Rose Garden. So they do have one, and we got an invitation to the, uh, to the dedication, and that's the first time we had heard about it, so <laughs> it was uh, very sweet. So they don't have a lot of roses in it, so we don't have a good picture of it, but uh, they, it does have the same layout as the state capitol garden. So then um, this is a wonderful school garden that TJ has really put in a lot of time and energy. And actually, he just got voted uh, volunteer of the year for the school district uh, for all the volunteer hours at, at this school in West Sacramento. So it's, uh, and the kids love it. They use it a lot for, for many, many things. So we're very proud of it. And we don't actually have a garden in Hiroshima, Japan, but we did go there in the early 90s, and uh, we made wonderful friends with them. They gave us permission to put one outside of Hiroshima and about eight miles at the Asian Olympics, and we declined because we didn't think anybody would take care of it very well after that. But we made wonderful friends, and their kids... Um, the youth from Hiroshima have participated in many of our uh, youth programs. So that's why we feel very attached to them, feel like they're part of our projects. So now, we'll talk about the elements of a really great public garden. And element number one is seven people-friendly features. So let's see if you guessed them. <laughs> Now the thing is, seven's my lucky number too. So there's this is like a double, like a double winner here. Okay. Location with great visibility. Uh, more than a million visitors see our gardens each year. Uh, that's true. Uh, probably well in excess of that. Just we just use million. It just seems like an easy word number to use. Uh, Martha the King Historic Site has uh, somewhere around 700,000 visitors each year. Um, People come from all over the United States and the world. This is where Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, that's where he worked, where he, excuse me, that's where he's born, where he worked, uh, and where he also uh, served, preached, and where he's laid to rest as well. And, uh, and they're in the tomb, they're in the tomb. We'll go back, can you go back just for a moment? Yes. Uh, 
Uh, actually, this is this like our garden is right. Oops, let's see what I got. Oh, great visibility. We're looking at um, normally that the area where your garden is located, that it has that it is has access to it. People have access to it. It's easy to find, uh, and or you may have even you may, even if you have parking issues. Uh, World Peace Rose Guard doesn't really have the most friendly parking system there, but people come from all over, and like it's, we'll go to the state capital in a moment, I'll talk more about that, but having a great location that where, where, this, is, where this is a place where people come, and, right, and this has access, and they have like, they have like parking, they have a whole parking lot that's just huge. Okay, and next is a great design, and this is an example, this is our state capital garden. And as you can see, it's a Victorian design, and it complements the architecture of the state capitol. And it um, is quite lovely, the way it's laid out. Next, a garden that has benches, so that people could sit in it and enjoy all the beautiful colors and fragrances. And um, we find that benches are, are a big hit in the gardens that we have. Arbors. This is another element that we have at, at the State Capitol Garden that has really been popular. There's so many weddings that people take pictures under there, and they tell us when they come in, they just feel embraced when they go through an arbor. Somehow it just makes them feel special like this, their own little place in there. It changes the energy of your garden is what it does. because it's, it's like this invisible little thing. When you walk through it, you feel you're on the other side of something unique and special, and people somehow feel that because in talking to all these various people who come to the garden at times, they just come up to you and start talking, pouring out their heart. You, 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 we figure this out and say, oh, this is unique. This is wild. So this is the result of what we did, what you do. Next is pathways. So people love to get lost in rose gardens, and so when you have pathways, they, they have the privacy to explore and to be uh, by themselves at times. And, and the kids love to run around, too, <laughs> and get lost and play hide-and-go-seek. So it's fun for all ages. A water feature. We have found that the fountain is so popular, and it doesn't have to be a fountain. It can be some kind of, uh, like a little stream of some kind, but the water seems to calm people with, uh, along with the roses. So we have found that that's been a big uh, asset to our gardens, too. And a ceremonial area. About the water feature, the, oh. the thing about the water feature that I see is that it's, it's kind of a spiritual thing, too, because you look at various religions, how water is used, baptisms, and different things like this. We see the World Peace Rose Garden, that fountain there, gets used for all kinds of different purposes. So when you create water, that water, it's people, uh, they find ways to use things. So if you create, the, create these different elements, they, they find unique ways. And, and when you come to the garden sometimes, you see this say, wow, I didn't realize that people use it for those things. Okay, the ceremonial area, we call this the Peace Pavilion. And it does have a heart-shaped seating wall around it. And there's many weddings there and um, family events. And it's, it's uh, been a very popular place to hold events. OK, element number two, stunning selection of roses. And this part has to go to TJ, because uh, this is his, his area of expertise. But he said this once, each garden is a living painting, and you are the artist. And I think you can all relate to that, that each, each of your personalities goes into your rose gardens. And so we figure that's what it should express. So the category of roses. So uh, you want to go and we'll go up to hit the next two, uh, next two buttons there. There you go, thanks. So I think when you create a really nice public garden, it's a matter of deciding what do you want to display to the public. Do you want to be a David Austin? Do you want to have old garden roses? Do you want hybrid teas, mini floras? Do you want miniatures? What is it that you want to showcase? And when I said that each garden is a living painting and each one of you are the artist, that's really what you really are. You're an artist. You are painting with living plants, the fish of flower of America. So this is a real privilege for you to do something for your community or people do things in their community. And so that's, you know, just, so I think once you decide, it's kind of like closing your eyes, say a prayer, and visualize what you want your garden to look like. 
and then back it up all the way to square one where you're at today, and that's the path to follow. And that's kind of like what we do. It's kind of like we visualize kind of like that, that final, what want that garden look like, and then realize, okay, what are the different things we're gonna have to go through to, to be able to accomplish this? And then we start from there. I, I think the criteria for selection of roses is is deciding what you want that garden to look like, and and hmm? well, it, it, of course you can look at your like when I look at a rose garden, I'm looking at the height, the bloom, fragrance, disease resistance. I'm looking at uh, the color uh, because like in our World Peace Rose Garden, where we're doing at State Capitol, you know, we have our own little private nursery, and we have probably. 150 roses in that private nursery in different varieties. And so we're testing those varieties in, in 10 gallon pots and we have our own, what I call best practices. And our best practices is as an example, is like to me in maintaining gardens and things like this, if I can't have fun, why do it? And so, you know, we're using a lot of organics and things like this. Yeah, is it, you get and, it, and we're always adding something new. So this, in the last two years, we've added probably 10, 15 percent new varieties to the World Peace Rose Garden, and and I see no end in sight. We're going to continue doing this uh, indefinitely because to me, that's how to keep that garden looking fresh and beautiful. When you create it, the day you dedicate it, that's the day you, in our minds we're saying we are committed to change, change for the better and always saying, what can, how can we improve things? Okay, and the last one is wall of bloom, and that's just creating exactly what it says. Like this is an example, you know, where you just see this big wall of just colors and uh, that people can go wow when they see it. And so there's another one of the Lake Shrine. Element number three, community use of gardens. This is uh, one that, I think is unique to our International World Peace Rose Gardens. And, uh, you know, they serve a variety of uses, but, you know, the first one is a sanctuary of peace, of love and beauty. People come there to heal, to be by themselves, to reflect, to be inspired. We just met with a staff person of, of Congresswoman Matsui two days ago. And she told us that there's a homeless man in our state capital garden who sends them pictures daily of the rose garden. Like that is what makes him feel good. He doesn't have a place to stay. I think he's a veteran. But he gets excited about being able to take a picture of that rose garden every day. And, they, and he must have a phone somehow and he emails it to them. He says, this is how the garden looks today. So it's... Uh, it's really a, a special place for that. And of course, as we said, it's a place for lots of activities, community, civic, family. Oh, I, like we tell you, over a thousand um, events are held at our state capital garden each year. So it uh, is definitely used. And for us, we showcase our youth uh, artwork and our messages of peace. And we'll give you an example of that. So here's some of the, the things that have happened. Some of our planting ceremonies. This was very touching. You know, our rose garden is in state capital is right next to the Vietnam Memorial. So we, we planted roses, veteran roses, right next to the area where the memorial is. And these are all veterans from World War II, from uh, Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, and they all came. Some of them only had one arm, and it was very touching. It was, uh, and they couldn't believe that we would do that for them. So that the garden has a little bit of everybody in it, which is, makes it very special. So, and then this is our planning ceremony at the school garden, and the whole school came out that day, and uh, different kids were selected from their classroom to actually plant the gardens. and. They had a ball doing it. And this is the Maria Shriver rose plant, rose bush. And she came. She's the one. You have your pointer. She's the one that's uh, planting it right there. And she. She's a nice bracelet right there, too. She 
She has nice jewelry too. She has a very nice Pete jewel. Day. <laughs> uh, what you'd expect of the first lady of California. You have to talk in the mic. But anyway, she was very welcoming and uh, spent a lot of time with the school kids there, and it was a beautiful event. And this is um, planting a rose bush at the Martin Luther King Historic Site, and Bernice King was able to come and, and do that for us. And so she loves the rose garden. She comes frequently. And then here's some photos from some of our dedications. And that's our Bishop Gallegos who went with us. And people were very impressed that we could take a bishop with us to Mexico City. They go, how'd you do that? <laughs> so it was pretty special. And the kids created artwork for the dedication. This was in Italy on our dedication day. And it was a, a beautiful day for the, a lot of the kids came out. And it was beautiful. So the state capitol, we were releasing the doves. And the uh, children. We're wearing multicultural costumes. This is a, an example of another event we've had at State Capitol. Losing my voice. <laughs> uh, this is the the Hmong, uh, the Hmong freedom fighters. Uh, they were a group of uh, soldiers who fought along U.S. soldiers in the Vietnam War, and uh, they were also uh, fought into La Laos there and things like this. And so this is the first time in their American history that they were honored uh, in a place in America. So they have their special plaque in Banch and Arbor in the World Peace Rose Garden. So right there is their arbor right there, right across from the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which we felt was an appropriate place. And so this brought a whole new element in the World Peace Rose Garden, honoring the diversity. And then here's a dedication of a bench in the World Peace Rose Garden. Uh, it's designed to honor the needs for uh, unity and togetherness among the various cultures and religions of the world. And then uh, the Muslim, after 9-11, a lot of people walked away from Muslims with a lot of hate and, and, un and misunderstandings. And we walked towards the Muslim community and says, you know, you're part of America. Would you like to be a part of this World Peace Rose Garden? Because this is about unity. You know, you're Americans just as much as I am, and Sylvia is. So, and so they embrace the idea, and they treat us like family. Even to this day, you know, there is such a, they have such a close relationship with us and us with them. This is kind of my expertise. We developed two programs. The Inspirational Message is a Peace Art Program. Oh, the Inspirational Message is a Peace, and the World Peace Begins With Me Art Program. So this is an example of the art. We had an exhibit at uh, the Martin Luther King Historic Site. And the little ones at the top, can you point to those, TJ? Are uh, Japanese artwork. And then the next level, the bigger ones are Italian artwork. And then you can't see, but the next level's Mexican artwork. And then the lower levels are from Atlanta and California schools. So we really do have a lot of uh, youth from around the world that participate. Um, here's some of the students that participated that did artwork for our state capital. And here's uh, a picture from Italy. We had an art exhibit there as well. And we have a lot of award ceremonies. As you see, our t-shirts, every time we have um, a ceremony, we give the kids t-shirts. And this was this year, our 20th anniversary of the Martin Luther King Historic Site Garden, and the kids from the Lake Shrine, where Gandhi Memorial participated. So we went and gave them t-shirts, and that was the, the ceremony. Uh, also, uh, students from the Gaza Strip through the United Nations um, program participated in the Martin Luther King contest. And we send them their t-shirts and everything, and they they have a ceremony, and these were the two winners. This year in Atlanta, we had del uh, students from China came who were winning students and uh, winning students from Mexico City. So it is international. Here's one of the Chinese students. Uh, here's one of the Southport. They also have message of peace contest.
This is the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site, and this is a, a photo with, uh, there is uh, Martin III right there, and there's Sylvia right there, and me right there, and the superintendent, and the assistant superintendent, and all these winning students for that participated in the inspirational messages of, con me inspirational messages of peace. And this is where we, you can see right here, this is where we put the inspirational messages. It creates, uh, when people come to the National Historic Site, they come to this area and then they stop and we see people reading them, photographing them, scribing them with paper. Uh, they videotape them um, and find great inspiration in what the children are saying. It's the same as our state capital. So involving youth in your garden to me is really uh, important in some way. And then here's an example. This one here is from uh, a student from Jinan, China. And then, of course, uh, we do some tours in the garden. And then here's our Arden Park Garden Club in the state capital, World Peace Rose Garden. And uh, here is uh, some, some of our friends from uh, the Mother Lode Rose Society. And also, I think there's a couple of members there, maybe. Uh, Can we hear See, right there. Right there. He is right there. See him? Is Martin. Martin and his wife right there. Yeah. And then in our World Peace Rose Garden, you can see how the roses mature as the year goes on. And so uh, this is a wedding photo I snapped from my cell phone just a week ago. And this is a, a gentleman walked, walking his daughter down the, down the aisle of the Rose Garden. And then here we have the, uh, the dancers. We also have International Days of Peace, which is a United Nations... Um, celebration around the world. There's like a billion people who celebrate. So we've been fortunate to have a lot of the different uh, celebrations in our state capital garden. And these are just some photos from, from those celebrations. We have a Chinese uh, singer. She's so lovely. We have our Mexican dancers, Aztec dancers, taiko drummers. And we always end all our ceremonies with the rose petal throwing ceremony. And people just love it. They love to be showered. So these are just some of the grand finale of throwing the rose petals. So anyway, that's really fun. All right, now we go to Mr. TJ, who will talk about uh, element number four. You need a really strong maintenance program. And so he'll share with you what he does in our gardens to uh, make them look good all the time. One of the things I do is I'd like to see us do is, is develop what we call best practices. So every garden, everyone should develop what I call their best practices. So to me, best practice in the World Peace Rose Garden is when we snip the blooms, we have a spray of blooms and the terminal bud is going fading. We snip out the terminal bud and leave the rest of the, of the flowers there. Because to me, people come to the rose gardens to see beauty and loveliness. So it takes an extra moment, but the thing is, is that um, you know when I snip blooms, I've got my technique down that I can snip somewhere as close to a thousand blooms an hour, and so um, you know I have my gloves I use. Um, I bought these at um, Harbor Freight for I think ten bucks with tax, and so I have things so I can be I I want to be fearless. If I'm afraid, if I fear the thorns then that slows me down. So I don't want to be afraid of anything. And then we use organic products, you know, like I like, I believe that uh, one of the ways of growing healthy roses is using foliar feeding. And I use uh, a little product, seaweedy extract. So I put a little of that every time you spray. So I'm spraying roses, really, I'm feeding, I think about not spraying roses, I'm feeding the roses. It's a different thought because if I want more blooms, want to look nicer and better, then when I spray, I'm really feeding. So I'm not, um, if, if we're thinking about the, uh, the mildew, black spot, rust, things like that, that's secondary to me, feeding. You know, you got hungry plants, let's feed them. And then I, use, I try to use organics like this is organ side. Uh, it's a miticide, insecticide, and fungicide. And uh, here's green cure. It's a baking soda additive, you know. And, um, and then here is uh, rose defense, which is a neem oil product. And then I use... You know, I use Windex for cleaning my sprayers every now and then. And regardless when I'm spraying or not, I use a mask. I use, I like respirators because you just, you just, you, there again, you just feel, I just feel so comfortable, whatever I do. 
Now, this is a battery-packed little motorized SureFlow sprayer. So when you're doing things in the garden, to me, I'd rather, I'd rather spend a few bucks on having good equipment. And then maybe I might not go out to dinner or the movie, but I got good equipment. And to me, I'd rather have better equipment than going out to dinner or going to the movie. Because, see, to me, when you plant a rose, what else can give you such a return on investment? Your $20 investment of a rose bush will give you hundreds of blooms over how many years? What else can give you a better return on investment? Your money in the bank gives you 1% or 2%. Look at the love and joy you can give with roses. You know what I mean? So this is a battery pack. It's a four-speed. It's a four-speed. It's, like it's like a stick shift. Just, put, just tweak your little finger right behind your back, and it goes one, two, three, four, and you, you can whisk through a garden. So, you know, if, if I can spray a garden, say his garden has a, a hundred and, say it has 300 roses, I want to be able to spray the garden a half hour, you know? That's, and this way you have fun. You go in and do it. And I, I have a 25-gallon a, a sprayer. And I took the tips on it, I drilled it out. Because when you do something, you want it, you want it. So I, I have a sprayer I use in one of my, in the garden. And it's a 25 gallon tank, I put it on a little cart. I, get, I use an RV battery in it, I drill the tips out so I get more volume because when you go to spray something, you need to get it done. If, and, I got, and I put a 50, 60 foot hose on it. So if I park at one spot, I can spray a whole region before I come back to move it. So if I want to spray a big garden, I can spray it in no time. So, so what I'm thinking is that in doing the gardens, it's got to be fun. All right. Um, also, uh, irrigation. When you, when you go through a garden, you always are looking at things. So you're looking at do you have any insects, do you have any disease? Uh, your irrigation, do you see any areas that when you irrigate, after you irrigate, is it dry? And if so, then you need to fix it because critters, squirrels, all kinds of things will damage your emitters over a period of time. So you always have to be taking a walk through your garden periodically. And then I also look to try to get the spent blooms removed as soon as possible. They come spent. I like to see the walkways cleaned. And you can use, like, a lot of times a little blower. And on low speed, you can use, like, a little blower just to, to get the, your, your leaves and things like that out of your way. So this way, when people come to the garden, it looks as beautiful and clean and nice and fresh as possible. Because the more we give people a nice, good experience in the gardens, then the more they're going to want to grow roses and the better chance they want to become a rose uh, enthusiast like us. Um, I wanted to mention that those... I wanted to mention those seven people-friendly features we talked about. One is when you want to do a public garden, location, design, benches, arbors, pathways, water feature, and ceremonial area. And one of the things we do in World Peace Rose Gardens, we try not to put in large blocks of one color of rose. We think that people want to see lots of variety. They want to see lots of diversity. And so we put in some blocks around, we have red roses around our arbors, our peace pavilion, and fountain. But outside of that, we're focusing on diversity because if you look at America today, it's all about diversity and it's increasing. So if people come to the garden, let's give them lots of choices. It's like going to the candy store or the ice cream store. You may only choose the vanilla or chocolate, but you really want to see that watermelon ice cream too. Okay, and then lastly, I want to talk, mention to you, um, before we get to the little question and answer before we get done, is that um, we're working on a special project. Um, we're looking at, in 2013, there's going to be a new rose coming out. Um, we've been working really diligently behind the scenes. Um, I wasn't able to totally put it together, so we brought together uh, another person on the team. Um, he was able to find a hybridizer, and so we're going to have a major announcement of a VIP rose uh, in America that will be coming out 2013 with a full introduction 2014. And the name of that rose is? It's a secret temporarily. But, <laughs> but I can tell you it's absolutely stunning. We almost lost sleep at night thinking about this one, trying to work with people and things like that to see this thing happen. And, and uh, 
our associate who came on board really helped us put this together. So we're really thrilled about it, and we're sure that you'll be hearing about it in the Rose World. But I just want to let you know that not only do we create World Peace Rose Gardens, we're trying to help spread the message and encourage more people throughout the United States to grow roses. And I think by using the idea of a VIP rose, which is named after it's a, a person rose, that, and I think you're going to enjoy the color, and we hope to see it as a queen of show someday in a, in a rose show, too. So you're not going not gonna to tell them, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> Is that nice? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to leave you a little mystery. We're going to say, what are those guys talking about? Well, stay tuned, because just as soon as it comes out, I'll see you next Okay, yeah, we got that's going to be a secret because uh, there are some very it, it's it goes it's a, it's 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 very, very I mean a city council in one city thought that they should honor this individual and they thought they should plant a whole rose garden to honor this individual as what they said at one time and so uh, when that didn't get done we decided you know let's just we're like the little engine that could you know we just keep trying and dreaming. And praying, and in, every, in our gardens, I think there's always been a grace of God that comes down and helps us when we need help. I did want to say that that TJ grows roses uh, for a long while until they're big before he puts them in the garden. And with our state capital garden, he took care of 2,500 roses for two years before, and then he picked the top 700 to go into the state capital garden. And it was a lot of work. <laughs> Let me tell you, have you ever taken care of 2,500 roses? Uh, we had teams of volunteers. I mean, our organization has really done a lot to, um, to make sure that that garden is the best. And actually, we trucked roses across the United States to Atlanta. We, we, <laughs> we got a, tr a refrigerated truck that donated a lot of the, well, the expense. And we followed that truck in a in a, what do you call it? A little van. Little van. Six-wheel van. With, with, art, van. with art panels, and we made six stops in six different states along the way, and we would give uh, the mayor uh, a rose bush for the Martin Luther King uh, as we went across, and we, poor TJ, he had to take out all the panels and put them up for all the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he also grew those ahead of time at his house for a whole year before they went in. So we have like instant rose gardens that seem to work really well uh, instead of the, the bare root. So the, the state capital garden, people were amazed because one week there was no, no roses and the next week was a whole rose garden. And people would, uh, we had a fence around and so many people would be standing around the fence watching this process happen as all these uh, beautiful full-grown roses were going into the ground. So I think that's sort of the magic, too, of, of uh, a public garden is, is really growing the best roses possible if you can. You know, it's a, it's a lot of work. And how many of you are part of public gardens here? Oh, well, yeah, so you know. <laughs> you know how all those things work. But, uh, you know, TJ's very modest, but he has been perfecting his rose techniques for 25 years. And, um, you know, if you have questions for him, being all rose lovers, uh, I'm sure he can, can answer them all. So we, uh, we thank you very much <laughs> for, uh, for having us here. And we have some questions. Yes, sir. Do you also use things such as um, focal points, whimsy, mystery? Do you add those to the garden itself concepts? Well, not in terms of where the place is, because like the state capitol is a very formal place, and so there's many things we cannot do there. Let's put it that way. But um, most of our gardens have themes, and um, we are able to have more flexibility in some of the other areas. So, you can use both ones in a formal garden like that. Is that something that you try to incorporate? Well, our, our, our arbors and fountains and benches really become uh, somewhat of some focal points in the garden because people come through 
and they see the courtyard, uh, they gravitate toward the benches, the harbors, uh, the fountain, the peace building. Those are like major stops. So like for a flag garden, I guess, does bring a lot of attention to that, to that one there. And then the inspirational messages, we see people uh, reading them all the time. And then, of course, uh, about 260,000 children come to State Capitol every year as part of the tours, part of the state of California. And the buses park right in front of the garden. They just pour in the garden. It looks like an invasion when they come off the buses in the garden. But I don't know if I answered your question. I think the element of the messages of peace in the, in the garden is a focal point for people that come. At least, we don't have messages of peace in all our gardens, but we do at the state capitol, there's about 45 messages. And in our Martin Luther King, there's uh, 29. So those are very popular focal points. I, I don't know if that's what you mean. Yeah, no, I mean, it could be anything. I was just trying to. Right. Yeah. I, I agree, you gotta have. Okay, you have another question? Yes. With, can you expand upon your foliar feeding when you start, what month, when you end, um, how often do you use uh, foliar feeding? Uh, whenever you spray is when you use foliar feeding. So whenever you spray, it's a good time to use it. Um, your foliar feeding is going to enhance your um, amount of uh, basal breaks. It's going to increase your sprays. You have more blooms. You have plants that don't normally develop sprays, which develop huge magnificent sprays. Um, you will find that uh, you're just got a healthy, more vigorous uh, bush, and then you also have the opportunity to print, print up more, more old wood and keep more new wood, and that's that's one of the benefits to be a foliar feeding. Do you stop foliar feeding at a given time? No, if I wear them spraying, now the only difference is like 365 days a year. No, I only spray probably from when it's been during the growing season, and then when is that? Um, like in California here, good point. Thank you very much. Uh, in California here, that would be uh, mid-March, mid-March through probably October, something like that, because then we want to let the roses start slowing down for winter, because in California we prune in, from, uh, in the first, the first right around the week of uh, December, right around the week of Christmas, I should say. How often? Uh, and like there again, I, I believe that spraying should be done what, twice a month or something like that? You know, sometimes, or if you think you got a bad problem, sometimes it might do it weekly at times, but wherever you spray, if you add a foliar element to it, uh, what we're seeing this foliar element is just gone hog wild. If you go to some of these uh, stores, these uh, hydroponic stores, they're so, they have so many products for foliar feeding. You know, I, won't, I don't have enough years in my lifetime, I have another 50 years to live, to test all the products. This thing, when I first started foliar feeding, when I first started growing roses, back in 1982 or so, I started that. I just got onto that. And then I, it, I just seemed to expand, and just grow and go. It's just, it's just totally incredible now. Yes? Uh, when you're building a, 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 a garden first, do you have a recommended base to use? Do you bring in compost? And, and I totally you? agree. I totally agree. So what, what we did is that in the World Peace Rose Garden is that uh, we actually, the holes you see there, we uh, actually got an 18 inch auger and augered the holes. Uh, we had seven, we had about almost 700, 675 holes to do. We realized we had some issues there, so we augered the holes and we then took a drill with a two inch, uh, two inch bit on it, small auger, with a little echo power tool, gas power tool, and we went down another 18 inches and then I put a, I put a shovel full of gravel down so we have, so we, boy, Compacting uh, we, because all the construction so, so could Sacramento compact was, that soil. Sacramento was primarily hard clay, so you were literally almost creating a pot. These things. Right, and then by and then what we did is we used actually we used pretty much the regular soil, brought in some compost, and blended that in what we were what we were planting. We used hard horse compost. We had a truckload of horse compost come in and throw a shovel full of two of each in each plant because here again we uh, were under the extreme timeline. Uh, because Sylvia set the dedication up, and it's going to happen next week, and we have seven roses to plant. And we have we have the roses in the field; they're muddy, and, and you know, you know what I mean. How do you prevent the large roses from going in the shop when you transplant? Uh, one of the things I, I use kelp I feed them kelp extracts, or water with kelp extracts, and um, because we grow our roses in ten-gallon pots, each rose weighs about fifty pounds. 
this was I, I can plant roses. Last last year I was planting roses. We had a, a spare the air day. I thought we could use water to till the soil, and I found out we had to dig 16 holes by hand. So uh, these this say uh, that was too much fun, but we did it. And with our roses, when you when we pot them up like the way we do it, you can plant them anytime with no no shock. They just take off. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge root ball. I mean. Um, I'm very interested in your organization, and mm -hmm. can you tell me your website and how we can support you? Yeah, I'll give you one of our cards. Well, here's the information okay. too, but we also have cards. Mm -hmm. You get a card. Here. Yes, sir. Do you highlight names of the roses, especially the, the peace roses? Peace uh, in the, yeah, good point. In, in the World Peace Rose Garden, we planted a military section of roses, like uh, uh, Desert, we had Desert Peace, uh, World War II Memorial Rose, we had uh, Memorial Day, we have uh, Veterans Honor, Silver Star, Bronze Star. Bronze Star was really a incredible rose, still is. And then, of course, we have the Peace Rose, uh, Lasting Peace, Love and Peace, Glowing Peace, <coughs> Uh, teaching in peace. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we try to find out the whole series of peace roses too. And then, and then we, we try to put the, the names on little three by five markers on stakes as well. So we try to you know try to get that nice that nice garden image there. Yes, sir. When you're fuller uh lawyers feeding your roses, do you use any kind of surfactant wedding agent? Uh, you can. Uh, Rose Mania sells a product. Um, I think it's Indicate Five or Indicate Somebody. Five. Five. Thank you. Uh, that that that's that's a good product. Or you could, or or Peaceful Valley Farm Supply has a really good product, and it is called um, uh, it's, it's extract. It's a uh, um, it. He's um. But if you go to peacefulvalleyfarmsupply.com, and you'll you'll see it. They have they have a it's it's a uh, uh, like a cactus juice type of uh, product. In the photograph showing the two of you in the garden, there, um, it looked like the roses were all a similar height. Did do you um, try to maintain a similar height throughout the garden? Um, if this is spring bloom, and right now, right right now. Um, we have roses that are eight feet tall, nine feet tall in the garden, and we have roses that are four feet tall in the garden. So our goal is that as time goes on, the row of the garden really becomes its own little special place because you see that each row becomes a sanctuary. The walkways become different sanctuaries because what you're going to see is that they they just like right here. You see what's happening here? Those the lady she's about five feet six or seven, and he's probably the same. But you can see the roses are almost towering over them. And as the year goes on, we like to let the roses grow. And when people see the first bloom, and then let the roses grow, because each time they come to the garden, it's a different experience. And that's something we like to do. So we don't like, if certain varieties have a certain uh, desire to grow, their DNA structure is taller, we let them grow taller. Those like to stay short, we let them stay short. We want the rose bush, whatever its nature, to become as big as vibrant, as powerful, as, as blooming, you know, to me, I'm a support base to that rose bush to see if they can do the best. So. In the design of your um, the fountains that you've chosen, um, we've been discouraged from our public garden not to use a water feature because of worries that people are going to bathe in and use it as a restroom, unfortunately. Has that been a problem? Or? You, you know, I, I find that I do a lot of, uh, one of the things where our biggest problem in the fountain, one of the biggest problem is algae. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a company called Moxie International. Moxie International sells a product called Moxie. And we seal this last fountain with Moxie, just it's a learning, learning curve. We just seal that fountain. Probably five, five coats of Moxie on that thing. Our algae, which is really a problem, that fountain is with a hassle, to be honest with you, is no longer. I mean, we haven't cleaned that fountain in a month. It's just gorgeous. But we stay away from the fountains that have the water on the bottom because so ours are a little higher and we have it up a little higher so that it makes it and we surround it with roses with lots of thorns. <laughs> <laughs> so they so have to be creative to keep people out, but I think if you do surround it with some roses, uh, you know, 
people don't like getting hurt. Yes. Oh, which one? Okay. The, the lady? Yeah. I will get you next to her, then we will come back over there. Okay. When Please you go ahead. Do you prune one third down, one half down? What do you do? Oh, you get a good point. Pr uh, pruning um, is, let me regress just a little. When it comes to the dead heading, I don't use that term with other people. I use, a, I use the term cutting spent blooms. It sounds more romantic. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I'm looking for someone to work in a garden, my first question I ask you, have you ever grown roses before? And they said yes, that's a strike against them. If they've ever read, if they've ever read a rose book, that's another strike against them. <laughs> because I find it takes me almost, it's sometimes almost impossible to train someone who wanted to do the rose. So if they know nothing, they need to say, okay, when we snip roses, we, we look where the bloom cuts, you know, where, where it came from, and we snip no more than 50% back, as an example. Um, ask your question again. Go ahead. To, um, oh, um, I was, when you print the Oh, what I'm printing is I leave as many good canes as possible, and I, I print two ways. I do my primary pruning, which is where I go through the garden and prune the roses and take out the weak and old canes, and then I cut spikes where I have an old cane that's been there, but it's got some nice spikes. I'll make some more spikes off of that if necessary. But I leave as many as possible. I don't, I don't cut. Um, I, I just don't believe that you should remove good canes just because you're trying to get to a number. I believe that Mother Nature really worked really hard, and I don't have the right to go decimate Mother Nature's works. I believe I should be a servant to Mother Nature. Sir, go ahead. You mentioned you used a product called Green Cure. Yes, sir. Does that work? That's uh, recommended by the ARS. Yeah, I, I use it. I think it's really a good product. It's about two tablespoons per gallon. And, I, and, it, and it has like a little bit of natural suffocant to it. And it, I think the one that features it doesn't change uh, soil pH, which is really big. Right. Yeah, and then, and then I'll add, now some cases when I use my Green Cure and I get insects, I'm gonna add I'm going to use three-quarters strength of organ side and three-quarters strength of the green cure because if I got insects, I want to try to get rid of those critters because green so you, cure. So you can mix the two together. Mm-hmm. Three-quarters what? Uh, three-quarters strength. So I, I'm using, so I'll, I'll mix sometimes products together to do more than just one. So if you're, you know, if you wanted to, as an example, if you are creating your own, um, say, uh, tea, your own uh, compost tea, then then go ahead and spray your, instead of using regular water, why not use compost tea for spraying, use that as a liquid, and then add your uh, green cure and organ side to that, and you're gonna find that your plants will respond miraculously, miraculously. Sir, please. Yes, I was just gonna make a little follow-up on that, especially when you're using the kelp seaweed when you're spraying things like the little black spots. I was gonna suggest <coughs> Could I make a comment on that? Because Dave can't say this. Uh, Dave has some, some of the most beautiful roses using that technique, so we can just verify from Santa Clara County Rose Society that the technique works very well, and I've never seen such beautiful roses doing that, so it's a proven working technique. Wow, that's great. Anyone else have any? Yeah. Sir, go ahead. Uh, the question of pruning, I think she wanted to know how far back you prune. Yeah. I, I, I prune, uh, I'm, I'm a modern pruner, and I prune back probably easy, easy, easily 50% of, of the growth. I'm probably about a 50% pruner. Well, if we got, I got a rosebush this tall, um, when I get done, it's gonna probably be about like this. 
good thought. <laughs> but the key is I don't want to overprint as well. And the other thing I do is there's a thing called secondary printing. So I come back, print the garden, and then I come back and I tweak it. I look at ones, I say, oh, I should trim this here, trim that there, and things like that. When I'm snipping blooms, I don't worry about if I'm, if I'm pruning, if I'm snipping a bloom to an inside bud, outside bud. I don't worry about uh, 45 degree, those are things like that. It just, none of those things are my vocabulary, because I don't, I found it doesn't make a difference to me. Okay, our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> but I did want to tell you that oh, part of our um, International Days of Peace with Children, we created these methods, these uh, qualities of peace. And we give them to the kids so that they can practice this quality of peace for a year. So I have some extra ones, and I'll stand in the back and I'll give you